and uh, figured out that he needed to change his life. So the personal story, maybe, I don't know how much we'll hear that, is interesting enough. But uh, Sujay's work has been to really uh, find a new way to use technology also to reach uh, the uh, patients and healthcare workers in rural settings. So five minutes from him. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks, Sanjay, for, uh, for being here and being in front of such an incredible group of people. ICARE is a for profit entity, uh, but for a social enterprise. So uh, a few months back, uh, the Edition Initiative, they covered around 68 innovations around the world. Uh, we were working in uh, one of the CSR projects in Sargoni in West Bengal, which is one of the most remote area. And uh, as part of this CSR initiative, they had a limit, uh, one medical team comprising the doctors, paramedics and the health worker. And they had to uh, manage 25 villages, all of them in a very remote area. And uh, when we landed there, the time was around 115 p.m. And by that time, we were seeing a uh, couple of patients already coming to that medical facility. And this medical facility was running every fortnight. So by the time they reached, uh, and they had already walked around 15 kilometers barefoot. When they reached, the doctors had already left. So they had two options. Either they had to wait for another two weeks to see uh, the doctor, or they had to walk additional, walk additional 20 kilometers where the central uh, thing was there. So iCure uh, is bringing this concept of the health workers and with a very simple bottom of technology which we talk about, that how we are enabling the health workers to act as the interface between the patients and the doctors and help in remote monitoring up to the last mile, even where there is no internet or electricity. So that's what we will talk about in my group. organization and I'm sure that's piqued your interest to learn a lot more. I thought I would open um, with a, the, the question about reaching scale and scalability and have each panelist share some thoughts and maybe also even thoughts for each other or questions for each other. So feel free to do that too. I think there are a couple of ideas that would be really interesting to explore. So we want to ask them how did you or are you getting the scale and scalability? Uh, how did you or are you? Will, are you getting to scale and sustainability? Um, are you, how are you leveraging the existing infrastructure? What have you had to build and what can you actually borrow or use that is there in the infrastructure? What mistakes and failures did you encounter that taught you something valuable? And how did you extract those lessons? And what evidence have you built that allows you to actually go to scale? How are you measuring impact or performance that in a, or cost effectiveness that's actually part of the scaling issue? So I'd love to hear thoughts from all of you on that. Please feel free, we can make this more informal. Jump in if you'd like to start us off. And uh, I'll just keep moving us along, but we really want to hear from all of you. Go ahead. So in our case, when we are setting up these uh, rural health clinics, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's echoing. Do not use the mic. Yeah, so. <laughs> so what we were doing is that uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, where we are operating, we are partnering with the local NGOs who have this existing infrastructures like buildings and then we are converting these uh, existing infrastructures as clinics with a very low capital investment. So what we are intending is that our first clinic we did at around two and a half years, we did around the bottom of the nine and then we set up our first clinic in 2012 November. Second one in uh, around February 2013, and in just a short span of time, we have scaled it up to 28. And the reason for scale up was that we were able to, as Jiri said, that we were able to use and leverage the existing infrastructure. In this case, these NGOs who have these existing buildings and facilities, we are able to convert uh, these facilities as clinics and bring IQOS technology expertise and uh, the operational expertise into its fold, thereby you know multiplying the effort. Ask me questions. Can we address all the 
reason for the command was not there, being there like that. Or even some of the modern child that gets space was, a lot of youth and company organizations were working very well in their spheres of, you know, uh, their, their local religious. It didn't scale up. Because government did not take it up to scale up. We would be dependent on government to scale up. Secondly, a lot of these uh, uh, programs are very resource intensive. It's easy to have health workers going home to home when you're funding and you know a group of command villages. But expanding that to scale is very difficult because the government is going to fund you. Who's going to fund you? Right? That's why uh, Arman's all projects uh, are, are, are depend on technology for scale. It's not technology uh, without a reason. So we use technology because we realize mobile mitra is no it's high uh, impact, you know, I mean high touch. Because we really uh, reach the woman twice a week. So we don't need, uh, need women, uh, resources in terms of human resources to reach across to them, right? And that's where we can scale up. So if we depend on, uh, you know, workers going twice a week, home to home, we can. Once a month doesn't happen, once a two months doesn't happen, actually. So depending upon technology, the scale up is very important. Second thing I realized was that you have to work with the government. You have to work with the government. Scale can't be reached without that. You have a huge government infrastructure there. So there's no point in going out there and replicating the system when you can actually use the government system to scale up. Right? So, uh, so we work with the government implementation. So uh, in government hospitals, we enroll women in the Maharashtra where we're working. The ANMs have the phones where they go home to home. are, and they can see phones are older than here. Also, now we've got phones going forward. So we really work hard to get in touch with Maharashtra and the Nalchem and develop partnership with them so that now in Angur Path, also now we've got some using our uh, mobile phones when they go and give care and go to the home home. So what is the government? Third thing I realized was that uh, you know, the problem with scalability is that you have to have extremely simple interventions. A complex intervention can be implemented in a small area. Scale up a complex intervention is very difficult. So have a very simple intervention which you have actually worked out to the last detail. It's like uh, you know, you have yeah, orchestrated, you know how to replicate. Because replication multiple other partners. So you can't have a very the problem with subjective programs. We're talking about uh, just because you're going home to home and giving information, you can maybe in a small setup do in a way that you can really train up a health worker to do it well. But scaling up and going through multiple different organizations, multiple different stakeholders, you lose control of those programs. So yeah, extremely important. So keep it extremely simple. The simple program scale up. Last part I realized don't depend on the government. I do scale up. If I uh, thought that uh, uh, in Mithra we could scale up a government, it would have happened. So started up with a scalable program, it is our duty to scale up. So Arma and Mithra is going to work for 1 million urban poor women now uh, because we have actually got the funding in. And going forward, we are also developing financial stability issues, uh, uh, models to make it sustainable. Fifth broad point, extremely important scale, financial sustainability. You cannot measure, you can have funding for small programs, massive funding for small programs. Three year programs, but after that, what? So, you, you have to really look at finances. Extremely important. And fifth, sixth point is impact assessment. And in our Mitra, everything, the program that is now, is not what started out with. At every point, at every implementation point, a scientist pilot, we tested out every little thing. Why did we do voice calls? Because we did a study and we realized that SMS won't work. Even with the emancipated, with the urban poor of uh, Mumbai Harabi, they don't know how to read the SMS. We didn't study to prove that. We thought that we would have IVR. We could not inform you, right? They're delivered, so it's usually human infancy messages. But IVR would work. We realized that women can't do IVR. They need really to go and now press 1, press 2, press 3. And you can't have press 2 if you're aborted. It's horrible, right? So, so even that we tested out. So you can't do IVR. So every point, uh, we really, like, you know, uh, so, uh, and then we also have impact assessment because we don't want to go to scale with the program that we have not put with the uh, world. Right? So, uh, with mobile Mitra, we have a huge RCD, randomized cluster trial going on in Maharashtra, where we actually testing the impact of the voice calls and the animation. The Mitra survey is done. So, we have actually got a baseline, a massive baseline, and then and it's part of a different UK, and we have a midline where we are actually looking so what are we doing with sending voice calls and animations. We wanted to remember the messages and then to act on them, they will change. So we have to see a... all doing this. It's yes. so fascinating. Yeah, so they want to make a story. Yeah. 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 Then we'll go, I want to definitely get yeah. this. Yeah. 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 Also being from IBM Oracle and being a solution architect in Oracle, it was quite, you know, uh, we need to develop a uh, high-end digital stuff for our technology. We didn't do that. We did a bottom-up uh, design where we literally spent time. Now we understood the challenges that the, the people who we using, they are 
have a very very neat design. We have to design a very simple and effective solution. Even in terms of the infrastructure, the internet bandwidth is not there. Absolutely, it's not there. So how we will be able to use such kind of things? And the way things have been designed, even a tribal network of two weeks of training, they are able to use us. So that's a great intro, Sandeep, because you have a similar approach, right? With getting the end user to spec out what the technology should do. Before that, I would add, yeah. you know, when my two colleagues spoke, you know, most of the time I could I could feel they're speaking for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's surprising, you know, uh, how there's so so many common elements about this. Um, I would like to bring out one or two that they haven't yet spoken about. One is training. That is one of the most important parts of a scaling design. Right? You have to get it right, and you have to get it right every time. So, um, I mean, it's interesting. The first director training we hired was a lady with a PhD and who had worked for ADD and who had worked as a lecturer for about 26 years. I mean, we paid a hell of a lot of money to her, but we realized that this is the only way. You standardize things, you make sure that every worker you pick up who is similar in tribal areas, zero difference. They should be able to deliver on our metrics. And the metrics are far more comprehensive again than what WHO or the government or any NGO practically anywhere in the world uses. Um, it even controls, for example, initial counseling has to last about 60 minutes. And our technology through fingerprinting ensures that if our worker is spending less than 45 minutes, he gets a reprimand, which is generated automatically by the technology. And a copy goes to the supervisor who says, hey, you're going to lose patience if this is what you do. You're going to realize this three months down the line, but you have wasted a lot of life still. So everything is driven by standard operating procedures, which are very simple, easy to remember, are now being loaded onto the tablets in many ways, including search and data. So that is where everything is. And secondly, innovation comes down from the cutting edge. So in our training, we have a session where these simulated workers are told, if you think work can be done better in some way, talk to your manager. If he doesn't listen to you, talk to your senior manager. If he doesn't listen, give me a ring. And there are people, health workers, and we have 230 of them. They ring me up and say, sir, I have something to discuss. And it is taken up. That is where our innovation comes from. Yeah. And that is why it works in the field. Great. Shivam, there's so many commonalities. <laughs> one commonality, yeah. one un non common is the word, that's one yeah. word. Yeah. That we use no technology. Exactly. You see that? Right. Because right. most use no technology. Emphasis is no technology. They get yeah. there and read it in my head. As a doctor, but this year I'll complete 50 years in medical practice. One like I can tell you, nobody listens. <laughs> I haven't been able to convert any alcoholic into an alcoholic, a non-smoker into a non-smoker into a non-smoker. There's only one patient I had once when I was young in practice who I gave a lecture, you should stop drinking alcohol, and he stopped drinking. The only problem was he was Italian, he didn't understand English. <laughs> so I have no idea what he meant. Communication is not what you say, communication is what he hears. And the, in, process, in the process of it, there is so much transformation. I tell you a true story. I'm a gastroenterologist, so I put a tube down the throat, found that this 20 year old kid had inflammation in the esophagus. Father was said the next afterwards, I said, listen, you got inflammation, take this pill a day. What else should I do, doctor? I said, just take a pill a day, you'll be all right. The father was angry, so my nurse, I call her Gail Mama, walked up and nudged me across, and she's a real proper nurse. He, she gave the lecture. Don't drink, stop aspirin, don't do coffee, lose 15 pounds, eat early, go for a walk, no light flat, use two pillows. After this, I walk. After she finished the lecture, I'm now making it up. This phone and go. I asked the patient, "What did Nurse Gail say?" This is called and go. The kid says, "She told me I can have beer once in a while." <laughs> <laughs> I 
Jagdhav Bhai here. I've done this many times. You can do the experiments with your people right there. Say something, they'll ask you for half an hour. The problem just doesn't stick. <coughs> something is the matter with the problem. And therefore, <coughs> I'm not an out of the box, box thinker, out of an Einstein. I see there's so much knowledge in the box itself, which we haven't used. So I'm within the box. <coughs> Inside the box, there's so much human I know. So I dig it out of the box, how can you use it differently? Let's talk about scale now. Scale is we started with 100 health workers in 2008 in District Palamiki in UP. By now we have 10,000 health workers. By the end of this year we would have trained 10,000 health workers. We had one state at that time. We had, we'll be, by the end of this year we'll be in eight states. Covering, we had few villages, 25 villages at that time. We'll be close to 1,000 now. But if you see the population footprint, it will be almost 12 million or 24 million, depending on what how you calculate the whole thing. Scalable. It is a scalable. Why is it scalable? Two reasons. One, A, you have to keep it simple. Anytime you make it complex, you're dead. I come to the business world. I can help you for business, so I still do it. So I understand positive cash flow is so important. That positive cash flow equals the sustainability. The problem with healthcare at the bottom of the pyramid is, in spite of what Professor Paralal says, there is no profit. If you really want to make profit, you have to ignore the bottom point, you have to go to the second and the third notch up to make some profit. Bottom there is nothing. So financial sustainability <coughs> is impossible. So as a part of social justice, somebody has to give. And therefore the costs have to be low. If you don't keep the cost low, you're not sustainable. And so therefore, how do we even sustain ourselves? We treat, we get volunteers within the village. Every village is wanted to help volunteers. And they volunteer. They come. They get trained. You ask for one, three, three people show up, three people show up. Show up. And they keep track of people within the community. Now, is this platform that we create at the bottom, can it absorb more programs? So we launched two more programs. One is population stabilization program funded by PFI, Population Partnership of India. And number two is TB, TB control. Like I was telling, the TB problem is not the treatment. The TB problem is detection. One person, before it's detected, the, the it's guess that has already infected 10 more people. So by the time you get a treatment, you get the program done and it's done. It's in fact, and for people, there's no way in the program. Shibar, if I may, so uh. what are the implications then for everyone here from your experience? We certainly heard the simplify message, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. And it's interesting to think about in the context of all these different programs. From the last couple of points you said, what are the implications on scaling that are more general? Uh, that's what I'm coming to. Okay. Scaling can't be done unless you have money. Yeah. Now these right. people have this got a for profit model, for profit model so they're sustainable. No, this no, girl no, this girl has, I'm talking. No. Uh, yeah. It's a positive cash flow problem, right? It's a positive cash flow, positive cash flow. So it's sustainable. She doesn't have any money, so she has to rely on funding from the do gooders of the world. And therefore she will sustain herself. I had to look for funding from agencies, etc. Funding need to so develop that people ignore us because they think we must not be doing something, anything good at all. Because we have no gadgets and this funding is so little. The key is, you have to understand healthcare to deliver it. Without that, it just doesn't work. And that's what the idea is. Scalability is deep knowledge of exactly how to do the thing. Now, what I would be interested in Aparna's model, one is that I have a platform, I invited them last time also, that use this platform. We have 10,000 people. Use them any way you want. Yeah, yeah, we are right. going to work with that. Collaboration one. is made. Yeah, but number two, <laughs> the problem is this: I'm interested in impact. Yes, we can. And the impact to me means maternal mortality is measured by number of mothers that die. To me, the only impact is are less less mothers dying after your program. That's all there is to it. Now you can give me a whole lot of other indicators. Keep it simple. So in our program, from 420, we brought out up close to 100, which is better than national average. Mm -hmm. In less than three years. We already met MDG goals if you are aware of this. And can this be done? Of course, 600 crores for the factor. Okay. So again, now the point is we want to use, I've just been told we actually lost the last 15 minutes and we should end it now, right? But I'm going to actually, in this case, 
I don't have a Nobel laureate, but I'm going to take a few more minutes because I really want to get a little more from our panel and all of you. Why don't, if there's any questions, let's just take a three minutes for a few questions, only if they're on scale and scaling. Yeah. And then uh, I want to hear a couple more thoughts from our panelists and we'll see if we can do a little more. Yeah. yeah. How are your models managed? System and I understand IQ. The two of you, I have not understood how it's managed. Good question. So I'll clarify. Our TB treatment is not sustainable. It's not cash flow positive. It works like an NGO. The government provides medicines, diagnostics, and physicians, um, which is worth about 70% of the total value. The rest 30% comes from other sources. Those other sources include donors, CSR, and now we are actually licensing and selling our technology. In this year, in the right year, uh, about 20% of our funding will actually come from profits made from sale of technology. So we are moving towards a situation where we don't need outside funding and we are cash flow neutral. Cool. Yeah, so we also not sustainable as of now, but we are developing more of sustainability because we realize very important. First thing is to keep it so low cost. So you know how much it costs to be a pregnant woman, voice calls, uh, for two years of her life, it only costs us to the voice calls. Well, that, that too also because the telecom companies give us at market rates. Mm -hmm. They are not giving us the lower rates. So keep it so low that it will be affordable for the women themselves. Are, are these automated voice calls? Automated voice calls. And then also middle class, so we have a cross subsidy model, cross subsidy model where we give middle class for uh, price and subsidize for the poor. Then there are a lot of other models that we are looking at, sponsor a mother program. So we are looking yeah. at models where we can make it sustainable. Okay. It has to become that. Okay. Quick question here, yeah? yeah? If you want to technology, how do you figure out the data reporting in the field is actually accurate and valid? Here's the deal. It's not based technology, don't get me wrong. It's, I don't want to be, you know, something like a Latite or something. No, it's not that. In fact, the National Health IT program, I was the co-author for the country, doing the National Health IT Standards and so on, which has become the, the regulation now. So I'm not against it as part of the National Knowledge Commission, I did it. The issue is, if I use technology, my costs go up. Number two, my training intensity goes up. Number Sir, I yeah. my question. How do you validate the data? How do you know the data is real? How do I know that we had outside agencies? For example, IIHM, Indian, Indian Institute of Health Management and Resources came out as an outside study. Sigma, which is a professional valid monitoring company, they came and do it. We're going, to, we're going to line up with the uh, health economics people of Lucknow University to come and validate the data. So the model goes like this, so innovate, validate, modify, revalidate, reprove, replicate, and scale. Okay. So each time we go That's in. a great so, mantra. So, so the idea is yeah. we are uh, working with outside agencies to validate. To validate the data. The right. question is other, besides that, right. I'm not here to impress anybody. To me, my, my, if I do work honestly, I don't have to ask anybody am I validated, am I doing the work or not. Okay. Take it or leave it, that's why the, 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 I waste more money. I'm telling you, for IHMR cost me three months of our work uh, finances just to tell them that we're doing good work. Because people would love to get it. Yeah, uh, just in, uh, in addition to that, in our model, what we are doing is that if you look at it, like the rural health clinics, the revenue model, one is coming from the patients who are really poor. Of course, we have a criteria, and then the other source of revenue is coming from technology. And of late, since we are creating a large network of people and untapped customer market base, there could be other additional sources of revenue which we can think of, yeah. and then try to make this whole uh, affordable and sustainable in the long term. It's back there, yeah. So scale up is not just about the organization or the financial model. Scale up is also about your own passion and bandwidth, yes, right? yeah. management. Yeah. Because every uh, social entrepreneurship organization begins with one passionate, you know, hero or, or, or the boss. How do you, if you want to grow or scale up, how do you call partners or how do you get success? Okay. Them? So how that you, you can move beyond one person yes. running yes. the exactly. show, right? Exactly. Yeah. Great question. It's yeah. a wonderful question you asked because the founder syndrome impacts a lot of organizations. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I am a full time bureaucrat. I say this, I am a full time bureaucrat. So, and I run Arman, but I have developed a wonderful team and I have all been here with me. So, a great team of uh, uh, people uh, with me uh, who have actually got ownership for the programs. So, a lot of uh, delegation of authority because when you own the program, you take it 
forward. Next, when we have NGO partners, we also uh, empower them with a lot of decision making power. You know, because you, when you spread, you need even the NGO partners to come up and actually want to participate in the program as well as you do. Not just that they are getting grants for you, they implement it, then it's over. Right? So, uh, you have to really get a lot of, uh, you have to have a lot of things going on the way. So, in our case also, like, uh, for instance, definitely because the scale is a challenge and uh, so what we have been able to do is that rope in very motivated, passionate people on board like we have stayed in the Dr. Nidhi Manutra who has joined the leadership team more than 25 years of experience and with the same passion that they are able to see and the connect. Although they are based in US but they are able to see that there is a whole lot of things that can be done in India. Sandeep, passion and vision, I don't yeah. know, that's the challenge. I'll add one more. Professionalized, professionalized, professionalized. Yeah. Yeah. I personally spend something like half an hour every week on our TV program. Uh, being the third largest, uh, third largest TV control NGO in the world, not just India, in the world. <coughs> I spend half an hour every month, every week. The rest of my time goes on to hemophilia, to diabetes, to now we're moving towards conference and healthcare. So professionalized, professionalized, professionalized. Simplify to a point where my passion is not needed to take it off. One thing. Second, I'd like to make a comment um, about something that Shivat said. When we introduce technology, we actually cut down our field task, field workforce by 35%. So our technology actually saves us money. It doesn't cost. Okay. Uh, quick question here. I have a question. So you talk about sustainability for the organization. You talk about the cost to the uh, in patients, but it's low. What about the in between the, 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 the healthcare workers that you deploy? How sustainable is their livelihood just based on what they get from you? So, in our case, it's very simple. Except for the two co founders, everybody is paid a market salary. You, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys, that's what we do. Why healthcare workers are paid so well, get so many paid holidays? <coughs> and such good level of work satisfaction that our attrition rate for, for anybody who's completed six months, the attrition rate, rate is something like 5%. Right? That's how I measure that I pay well, I pay market salaries, and I'm getting good. You talk about 10,000 volunteers and yeah. so you talk about uh, We uh, I had two of the workers with that work with us. Can you stand up, Amit? Amit and Anwar. These are field workers and, and Amit. Uh, Amit is an MPH from John Hopkins, he's a doctor, he's a marathon runner, and he's number 22 in the Bombay Marathon, is number 5 in Bangalore and so on, right? And Anwar is a graduate right of this institute here, his MSW, and they are the field workers, they work there. Now, with them, under them there's one more layer that is paid. The bottom layer is not paid, the attrition rate is 25 to 30 percent a year, and I love it. Because if I have attrition 30%, that means I have to train more people. To me, there should be health activists in every household. We are in every village in Amity at the moment. And if they fall off their chart, we will add some more. To make this model sustainable, we create songs and slogans within the village. They write their songs, which has the health seven messages, and give a tune to it and sing it. So I'm hoping it will pass on to the next generation, just the way Janakaraman passed on to me, I don't know who wrote it. The idea being, this is sustainable if we use the same whole techniques. My guess is, I may be wrong, we will uh, see the sustainability in four or five years, walk off the thing and see what happens. My guess is part of it is sustainable. Now two things I want to tell you, interesting, interesting thing. Slogans, what do the slogans mean? Uh, for example, uh, Immunization, you have, uh, you start with uh, uh, BCG, DPT, MMR, so on and so forth. Uh, since I'm a physician, to me, the first immunization is mother's milk. Mother's milk is the nutrition. But I know the more purpose, bigger purpose is, is, is uh, immunization. In our villages, the slogan is, Bala Dika! Everybody will shout, Maka <laughs> So you go there and open a meeting, Anwar, am I right? That means the first vaccination mother's milk. Bill Gates came to one of our programs. Scalability is the following, I'll tell you in a minute. And he asked somebody to give us the immunization schedule. He thought he'd get his you know, medical student answer. She got a Pahla Dika Makadu. And he owned that thing. He said, I'm going to repeat it in the car and he's going to be our next bit. 
Okay, all right. And scalability, he's doing this program in 40 districts. 40 districts, you. Quick buffer about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we actually do not have so many networkers. We use technology breakdown. Everything is dependent on networkers. So what do you mean? What do you mean? Because we require very few. How, how sustainable is it for their livelihood that they'll just no, be as the, the, they want this? No, so uh, in Mumbai, our health workers or the people who work in the office in Brody, they are paid a salary because they also do impact assessment, they fill out our surveys and everything. So they are actually salary people with us. And going forward, we would not need in the slums of Mumbai health workers. That's our plan. Because then word of mouth spread and we have made enrollment very easy. But right? we don't need health workers eventually in the slums of Mumbai. Right now, what we do is we work depending on community success. Okay, we are paid incentive for including women. We don't tell them that this is sustainable for their uh, livelihood. Because that's not the point. We're not. In rural Maharashtra, we are pretty hell on the They are earning from the villagers. When they go and do a preparation and do a unit test, they will actually learn from the, from the villagers who are ready to pay. And the skill this uh, team them, like homology preparation uh, and all of that, not just for women and children, it's also for diabetics. Or other populations. So they can they use the skill set for different populations too. So uh, the hope is that they can earn at least thousand, two thousand rupees or so per month from earning from your own individual. Uh, in our case, apart from paying the market salary, like for the health of the for the doctors, what we are doing, like since we are hiring the GPs. We try to give them a more sense of ownership and then we bring in CAA programs and we try to you know, engage in, in various other ways uh, and that's how we are able to bring that respect and refuge uh, in their career. That's how we are. That's not a full time job. So um, there's a lot more to learn and clearly each of them has a depth of experience and passion and data and many, many different things they've tried as I, I know all of you do too. So, um, sorry we're out of time, but thank you all for bearing with the noise and the fans and all of that. And uh, we had a great discussion. So, thank you to our panel.